It's a delight to welcome you to worship on this Trinity Sunday. Some of us gathered in person, others joining online as we come together to worship God. I'm going to read some verses from the Psalms to lead us into our worship. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Our first hymn today is a hymn of praise. It's in Singing of the Faith at number 39. Angel voices ever singing round thy throne of light. 39 in Singing the Faith. hymn of praise we turn to a prayer of praise and then a prayer of confession so let us pray O oh, sing to the lord a new song for he has done marvelous things god our creator we praise you in the beginning you called the universe into being Every morning you renew the face of the earth. You sustain us moment by moment by your power and love. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. God, our Redeemer, we praise you. When the world turned from you, you gave your law to guide us and your prophets to bring us your word. In the fullness of time, you came to us in Jesus, living, dying, and raised to new life to restore our relationship with you. With infinite patience and unfailing love, you draw us to yourself. I sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. God, our renewer, we praise you. At the dawn of time, you moved over the face of the waters. 
at Pentecost, you came upon the apostles as wind and fire. You work today in human hearts and in our world as the midwife of the kingdom. I will sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. God, our creator, our redeemer, and our renewer, in song and in silence, with hearts and voices, in our worship and in our lives, we praise you. I will sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. Amen. The prayer of confession. Holy God, you call us to sing a new song, a song of love and praise. But we know that our response to you is often half-hearted or neglectful and sometimes downright disobedient. We follow the old rhythms of selfishness and we give room in our hearts and lives to attitudes and behaviours which harm others and grieve you. In your presence and in the company of our Christian friends, we confess our sins. We ask for your forgiveness and for your renewing grace to retune our lives that we may sing your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We listen now for God's word in our readings, first from Isaiah and then from John's Gospel. The reading is from Isaiah, chapter 6 verses 1 to 8. God calls Isaiah to be a prophet. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on his throne, high and exalted, and his robe filled the whole temple. Round him flaming creatures were standing, each of which had six wings. Each creature covered its face with two wings, and its body with two and use the other two for flying. They were calling out to each other, holy, 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 the Lord Almighty is holy. His glory fills the world. The sound of their voices made the foundation of the temple shake and the temple itself was filled with smoke. I said, there is no hope for me. I am doomed because every word that passes my lips is sinful and I live among a people whose every word is sinful. And yet, with my own eyes, I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the creatures flew down to me, carrying a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with the burning coal and said, this has touched your lips, and now your guilt is gone, and your sins are forgiven. That I heard the Lord say, whom shall I send? Who will be our messenger? And I answered, I will go, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. John 3, verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. 
The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn is a prayer that God the Holy Spirit will guide us and help us as we reflect on the readings from Scripture. And it's in Singing the Faith at 394. Spirit of God, unseen as the wind, gentle as is the Dove, 394. Spirit of God, so work among us that the words spoken, read, heard, and understood may convey the grace and love of God to our hearts and bring us grace and peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I went to visit two of our East Finchley members about 10 days ago. This was quite an event for me at least, because it meant actually going into someone else's house. And it's a long time since I was last able to do that. And I've really missed it, as I'm sure we all have. Anyway, we had a cup of tea and a prayer. And as we were talking, they shared with me a list of 20 questions about life, which they thought would repay reflection. The first was, if you had to choose a new forename, what would it be? Another was, what age would you most like to be? And another, have you any unfilled ambition? 
Lots of food for thought there. Just one of the questions was directly religious, and it was this, do you believe there is a God? Thinking about those questions and that final question, as I came to look at our readings for today, I wondered about adding one further question or group of questions. Have you met God? If you have, where and how did it happen? What was it like? What is your experience of God? Easier, perhaps, to name our favourite film or to choose our Desert Island Discs, but really, really important questions. And ones the Bible and the Christian tradition answer in a whole variety of ways. In Scripture, Hagar finds God when she is alone and desperate in the desert. Moses meets God when he sees a bush on fire and goes to take a closer look. Elijah hears God in a sound of sheer silence when he is fleeing for his life. And the Israelites in exile, far from home, discover God by the rivers of Babylon. In the story of the church, John Wesley felt his heart strangely warmed when he was sitting in a meeting, listening to somebody reading an old sermon. And it was as Christian people came to experience God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that they made sense of this through the idea of the Trinity, the insight we particularly remember on this Sunday in the year. So how would we answer those questions? Have you met God? Where and how did it happen? What was it like? What is your experience of God? Isaiah 6 offers one of the Bible's classic answers. I mentioned Hagar and Moses and Elijah, first of all, this morning, to remind us that not everyone meets God in the dramatic way that Isaiah did. So if we don't see heavenly creatures around us this morning, that doesn't mean that God isn't here. But Isaiah's vision is powerful and instructive, and I'd like to draw out from it two contrasts and three consequences. Let's start with the contrasts. The first one is between human limitation and God's majesty, and it's expressed in the very first verse of our reading today. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Many of us will have watched some or a lot of the coverage of the death of the Duke of Edinburgh a few weeks ago. And we will have shared in that sense of the end of an era as his long life drew to its close. The Duke died within a few weeks of his 100th birthday. And that is a remarkable achievement by any standards. In a similar way, King Uzziah was the longest reigning monarch of the Old Testament. And his death must have felt like a huge change to Isaiah and his contemporaries, a reminder of human mortality and finitude. The vision in Isaiah 6 of the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, points the contrast between God and the most powerful of human beings. On the one hand, the king with his palace, his armies, his servants, his wealth, now gone to his grave. And on the other hand, God, enthroned in majesty, attended by the seraphim, filling the temple with his glory. Second contrast is between human sinfulness and God's holiness. Remember Isaiah's cry of dismay, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. The vision emphasizes the separation between a holy God and flawed and fallible human beings. We are sinful people, snarled up in social structures which express and reinforce ways of living and being which are poles away from God's will for us. And this causes the prophet to call out in despair. Two contrasts then, and now three consequences. The first consequence follows on immediately from Isaiah's cry, and it's a realization of need. Isaiah sees the gulf 
between himself and God. And he understands that as well as the gulf between the human and the divine, there's also the moral separation between a holy God and a sinful person living in a fallen world. We are not the people God intended us to be. We are not in any fit state to see God. Indeed, the vision of God acts as an alarming disclosure of the truth about us and about our world. We need a new start. In the language of John 3, our gospel reading today, we need to be born again if we are to see, to experience, and to enjoy the kingdom of God. And then the second consequence, renewal by God's gracious act. Isaiah is dismayed. God's response is to send a seraph with one of the burning coals from the altar to take away his guilt and his sin. God reaches out to us in our need, in our lostness, and does all that is necessary to put right the broken relationship and to bring us forgiveness, healing, and peace. In Isaiah 6, this is symbolized by the burning coal from the altar. In Christian understanding, of course, God's grace comes to us in Jesus, living, dying, risen, and ascended. We are renewed, we are born again through the powerful saving initiative of God in Jesus Christ. And we enter into this new life through water and the Spirit as we join the people of God through baptism, the symbol of faith and obedience, and as we receive the Holy Spirit, who enables us to live in God's way. The third consequence is a response to God's call. Whom shall I send, and who will go for us, says God. And Isaiah's reply, here am I, send me. It's important to notice the sequence here. The call to serve comes after the experience of grace. Theologically, that's crucial. We don't do things for God in order to make God love us and accept us. Rather, we respond to God's call because God has loved us and does love us. The gospel rhythm is always grace and then response. But having said that, human experience doesn't always correspond neatly and tidily with our theology. It's entirely possible that a person may hear God's invitation to do something before they've grasped the message of grace. We shouldn't worry about that. God knows what he's doing. We began this morning with a whole lot of questions, and I encourage you to keep on thinking them through especially asking yourself, what is my experience of God? I hope and pray that we may all know God, not just in his majesty and holiness, but above all, in his renewing and redeeming love. Love embodied in Jesus and communicated by the Holy Spirit. And that we may respond to that love in faith, in worship, and in service. May it be so. Amen. Going to take a couple of moments now for quiet thought as we mull over the readings we've heard today, the hymns we've heard or sung, the thoughts that God has prompted in our hearts as a response to all of that or from wherever else those thoughts have come at God's bidding. We have a chance to bring our reflections and our responses to God in quiet prayer. And then we'll turn to our prayers of intercession.
know, our prayers of concern, our prayers for God's will, there is a response to the words, Lord, hear us. I invite you to join with me in the response, which is, Lord, graciously hear us. So let us pray. God of all kindness, you gave your only son because you love the world so much. We pray for the peace of the world. Move among us by your spirit. Break down barriers of fear, suspicion, prejudice and hatred. Heal the human family of its divisions and unite it in the bonds of justice and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Pray for our country. Enrich our common life Strengthen the forces of truth and goodness. Teach us to share prosperity and to bear one another's burdens. And those who are the most vulnerable may pass from need and despair to dignity and joy. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Pray for those who suffer, those who are going through the experience of illness or of bereavement, those whose suffering is very visible, those who are outwardly well, but, but damaged or wounded or struggling in spirit. We pray for those who are caring for loved ones, that they too may know your strength. Surround them all with your love. Support them with your resources. Console them with your comfort and give them hope and courage beyond themselves. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for our families, for those whom we love. Protect them at home. Support them in times of difficulty and anxiety. That they may grow together in mutual love and understanding and rest content in one another. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the church. We pray for the congregations and communities we ourselves know best. For the churches of our circuit, for our ecumenical friends and neighbors and for the church across the world. Keep her true to the gospel and responsive to the gifts and needs of all. Make known your saving power in Jesus Christ by the witness of her faith, her worship, and her life. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Eternal God, we remember with thanksgiving those who have gone before us in the way of Christ. Keep us united with all your people on earth and in heaven. Grant that as we journey through the years, we may know joys that are without end. And at the last, come to that abiding city where you reign in glory everlasting. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
when we gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The prayer of dedication, we aren't receiving a physical offering, but people are offering gifts in many ways for God's work. And we dedicate those gifts in a prayer now. Lord, you are the giver of all good gifts. You grant to us resources and opportunities, time and talents to use to make your love real in your world. We thank you for your generosity. And we pray that you will receive all that we can offer, all that we are and all that we can be, so that through our lives your kingdom may be strengthened and your church built up. In Jesus' name. Amen. So to our final hymn today, following on from that story of the call of Isaiah, we sing from Singing the Faith 673. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? 673 in Singing the Faith. the Holy Trinity make you strong in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen.